Welcome to those online. Today is Father's Day. You know, we think that we'll bring fathers to the church, but we're here. Amen? Amen. We're here. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. Uh, as you know, for those of you uh, whose fathers have been gone to the Lord, we comfort, speak comfort to your heart. May memories of good fatherhood stay with you. We all get to be orphans if we, long, if we live long enough. Amen? But it doesn't mean that your life is messed up. It's just the way life is. Amen? We, we comfort those who just lost their fathers recently. And we ask that the Spirit of the Lord keep you and cover you. Amen? So, if you're a father in the house, all the fathers in the house, all the fathers online, we wish you a great Father's Day. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Amen. Uh, I know we're not that many, but we can still hear your voice. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, I've been getting all kinds of notes about Happy Father's Day. We'll talk just a few minutes this day because I know some of you got to go and do what you need to do. You know, so by the grace of God, we come back next Sunday. We'll get back to great routine, but it will be good if this place is also filled on Father's Day. But I know many of you brothers and sisters are with, going to be with families. I say that's what, it, what happens when you live in a holiday area. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So let's talk a bit about what are some of the attributes of fatherhood. What are some of the attributes of fatherhood? Now, I want to begin by getting on my soapbox a bit about what happens in this culture. Almost in most programs and television programs you see in this country, the father is a buffoon, the father is a fool, the father is stupid. Oh, come on, don't, you know. Doesn't know anything. So this is a culture that devalues fathers. It is a culture that has encouraged men to have children without marrying the women they have children with. Okay, so, so we have people, and we, 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 we I know I'm not, we have people who have children, you know, and say, oh, they're a good father, but they don't want to be committed to a family. I'll, be, I'll, I'll keep that down, okay? But we also have a society that doesn't want the fathers to be present, even though they say they want the fathers to be present. I can give you all kinds of stuff that happens to men in society. Now, we, ladies, don't get upset, don't get offended because I talked about you all a little bit on Mother's Day. So let's talk to men today, and I want you to also hear because there's this idea in the in the West is on television, and Hollywood makes it that fathers are not that important. Oh, come on. You've watched the television series. The way fathers are portrayed in television is what makes people disrespect fathers the way they do. But it's not the society necessarily that started that. It, part of the problem started with when people began to want to remove the word father from scripture. There's a lot of churches that will not say our father who art in heaven. So we need to understand that both the, especially the liberal church, the liberal church is a dying church. And part of our issue is that we want to remove all landmarks. Okay? Okay? If we remove all landmarks, then we should not complain about what's happening in society. There's a balance in scripture. 
Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. I, I'm not being chauvinistic, but we live in a society where the mothers get more honor than the fathers, even the fathers that stay with their children. Oh, come on, that's the way society is. So we, if, we, if we want to build society and we want to build it in a balanced way, because we want to talk about all these alphabet people, you know, if we want to build society, we need to go back to biblical models. Now, it doesn't mean everything in the Bible you know, from the, the, the culturally structured should be followed. No, but we must go back to the way that the Lord structured it. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. So, which means, and by the way, in the Bible, the father is mentioned first. One of the reasons people are having problem with the sonship of Jesus Christ is because they don't want to accept the fatherhood of God. So, you know, if God is father, so, but the scripture uses father. I think that prophetically, God knew that the day will come when fatherhood will be under attack. Fatherhood is under attack in a different way from, where, from how motherhood is under attack. But motherhood is also under, under attack. But let's talk about fathers today. Because the last two, when I talked about Mother's Day, I told you that there are two types of mothers that are manifested in creation. And but let's go back and talk about, we haven't even talked about fathers enough to actually in this generation, at least in the West, to be able to understand what a father is. So if you're having a hard time, understanding God as father, then you already messed up the foundation of the process. You can't even accept Jesus Christ as son without accepting him as a father. You understanding me? This society, and I want to say stuff that liberals may not like, this society set a structure in which fathers being at home was a problem. Oh, come on. In the African-American community, the United States government and the Department of Social Justice made it difficult for the fathers to be at home. So if a woman had a man at home, she didn't get help. If she kicked the man out of the house, then she got help. And I think sometimes liberals and even conservatives, conservatives too, forget that the society set the process by which the black family has come under attack. So what will a woman do if her husband doesn't have a job that pays well and can't really take care of her family and the government says, we're going to give help to you only if you're alone. That's what the society did. For those of you who don't know that this happened, for those conservatives that are listening to me, that's the structure. So we must then, in spite of what society has done to undermine fatherhood, we must then begin to value those men who stay and take care of their children. We must value those men who father their children. Fathering a child is not just the fact that you got together with a woman and put something in her and she gave you a baby. Fathering a child is being present. So the first attribute of fatherhood is presence. The first attribute is what? Presence. Presence, whatever you, are, you interpret it, let's just say being physically present, being mentally present, being spiritually present. But in the society, for the father to be present 
and be wholesomely present. The first commandment must be taken seriously. Honor thy father. A lot of people talk about, oh, he's not a real father because he's not, doesn't have money, can do this, can do that. That's true. But he's still a father. Okay? But like I said before, fatherhood is not just searing a child by putting a seed in a woman. Fatherhood is being present. So, it's, it's very important to do this. So, is God our father? The answer is yes. I'm not one of those who's going to say you need to take away the father from the Bible. Because the Bible begins, our father who art in heaven. And then it also says we have, one, we have one father. We have one father. God in heaven is our father. God the creator is our father. It is so, so strong that even the Messiah is called the everlasting father. We've structured society in such a way that we want to make fathers irrelevant. One of the worst movies or things that everyone likes, you know, a lot of people watch, is like The Simpsons. The father is a dunce. And always making mistakes. Love and marriage. The man is stupid. The man doesn't have a good job. The man doesn't have this. But you notice that the way we've structured is to what? Even make young people feel that they cannot actually be a father because the being a father is a stupid thing, supposedly. That's what society is doing. Say, oh, that's no, but that's exactly what's happening. It's amazing how in families, in the modern families, the father is always put down. Always put down. Conversation is, he's the imperfect one in the family. He's the one that makes all the mistakes. He's the one that is, doesn't understand anything that's going on. But that's a lie from the pit of hell. So if you have a father that is present, take that as one mark of the attribute of divine fatherhood. Now, for those men who are absent in the life of their children, you're not really a father. You're just a seed donator. There's a difference between donating your seed and being present. I'm sorry. And being present. You can always make time or create a point where you're present for your children. And now, maybe you had them and you were not present before. But when presence becomes characteristic of your being, then you have begun to be a father. You may not be able to be there physically, but you can be there mentally. You can be there communicatively. You can be there other ways. Presence is a powerful thing. Presence can help you clean out some of your fault. You see, one thing I notice about children is as long as the father is around, they just adore the father. Some fathers are mean, but children just want their fathers around. There's something. I was watching this man and his son in the place where we went for conference. This young man, I was so proud. You know, the, the kid was like, the father couldn't go anywhere. He was like playing with his father, looking for attention, and the father was just smiling and laughing. And I asked the guy, I said, what's up? He says, no, this one, I can't go anywhere without him screaming and shouting. He wants to go with me, so I bring him everywhere I go. And, and, and I, I heard them having a conversation, and the, the boy saying, I want to be around you, daddy. It's not even up to six years old. He says, okay, that's okay, my son. You know, and he just took him and patted his head. But my point is, presence matters. But presence, some people have to work. Now, listen, people have to go to work, but presence matters. Presence is 
psychological. Presence is spiritual. Presence is communicative. God is in heaven, our Father is in heaven, but he sent his Son. We can even feel his presence by the things he has made around us. I know a lot of fathers who work two, three jobs when I was coming up to make sure their family survives. The thing about society is it defines what a father should do. And when the father goes to do it, then everybody complains. Presence is so layered I could keep going. Number two, I just said the word presence. Number two, a real father operates in faith. What do I mean by a real father operates in faith? One of the attributes is the real father believes in the divine, divine possible future of the seed they've brought into the world. So, so, so if you're a father, and sisters, I know today still we talk about fathers, because you, got, you have fathers too. So fathers, a real father believes in the what? the divinely orchestrated possibility of a future or the, the a future of divine possibility, if you want to put it that way. So, a father is a person who carries faith for the seed they've brought into the world. If you're a father and if you're a young person, begin to write this down because you're going to need to know this. If you're a father, if you're going to adopt, if you're going to give birth, what well, are you going to give? No, you're not going to give birth, but if you're going to put your seed in a woman to bring forth a seed for you, you better understand that what you're doing is to be a father, sorry, that to be a father, you must express your belief that there's a divine possibility for this seed you're bringing into the world. This is one of the reasons why a lot of people who say they don't have faith have a problem raising children. But the problem we're having is if you don't believe in the possibility or future possibility of the seed you're bringing into the world, why bring the seed into the world? When you bring a seed into the world, if you're a father, you must have faith. I'm not even faith in God. I'm not even asking you to have faith in God. I'm asking you to have faith in the future possibility of the seed that you're bringing. So a father should never be the one that tells a child that the child will never amount to something. No matter how angry you are, no matter how upset you are, you can never stop believing in the future possibility of the child that you brought into the world. The funny thing is the older I get, the more I realize that that stuff has to be there. I cannot give up on the future of the seed that I brought in the world, no matter how old they are. Because, you know, kids, we all are children of someone. We never stop being stupid. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Did I just say that? Yes. So we're always, we're always doing stuff that makes our parents cringe. So if you're, if you're a father, you must, in all circumstances, keep your eye on the faith possibility of a divinely manifested future. To talk to fathers about this, a father must be the one that constantly speaks of a possible future. That means this is faith, what? This is faith intertwined with hope. A father who is a hopelessness teacher, speaker, being, who has a hopeless mode of being, is not a father. Because just like a father is a seed carrier that brings the baby forth, the father is a seed carrier of the hope for a future world, a divinely orchestrated future for the generations of those that are committed to him. 
If you're adopted, if it's a child, you know, you know, people say you don't have to, I can tell you, you don't have to actually have a seed by a woman to be a father. But if you are someone who understands the meaning of fatherhood, you have to have a vision of a possible divine future. Now, as believers, can you understand that a father is someone who is a priest by nature. We're all priests, but a father is someone who's a priest by nature. They are the ones who stand between this realm and the other realm. For the children that they brought into the world, for the children of the world. I mean, I put it that way. So, but that's such a powerful stuff because it means for us as believers. So you can't. Whether you're, whether you're an atheist or a Christian, watch this. If you have faith in the future, you pray without religion. Anyone who believes that their children shall survive in the future and prosper and be great is already praying. You can tell me you're an atheist. You want your children to survive? Yes. You want your children to do well? Yes. Then guess what? You are praying. You may be praying to something you don't know. You may be praying to an empty space, but you're still praying. You believe that that child is going to become something great. You may be praying. You know what? Somebody says that someone had religion without God. It's a reality. So I said, I said number one is what? Presence. Number two is what? Faith. Number three is what? Priesthood. What is priesthood? A priest is someone who stands between this realm and the next realm and allows the stuff in the future to come to the present. So that means a, a, a real father is a priest. Who, who, what, who mediates between realms, who mediates between possibilities, who stands there and says, this is where we are, that's where we are going. And by the commitment of the life of the individual who is a father, right? My father is a priest. What is a priest? A priest is the one who stands between this realm and the other realm. So every father, whether the person is a Christian or whether they're Buddhist, whether they're whatever they are, must be someone who operates as the priest for the future generation. So, 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 you, you got to understand this, this thing about priesthood. What's a priest? A priest brings worlds together. A priest opens up dimension by a, of a let me, by ritual behaviors. So a priest opens up what? The dimensions by ritual, by ritual behavior. Do you know men are ritual creatures, just like human beings are. But let's, we're talking about fathers today, okay? Don't give me what about this thing. Let's talk about fathers, because we all like to do what about, what about, what about. But right now we're talking about fathers, right? What's the first attribute of a father? Presence. Say it with me. What's the second attribute that I told you? Faith. Faith intertwined with what? Hope. All right? Number three. A father is a priest, a mediator of worlds, an opener of dimensions, a ritual presence of future possibilities. Which is why every father must be a worshiper. Whether you worship at the altar of football or whether you worship at the church, whether you worship at the altar of basketball, whether you worship at the altar, but you must be a worshiper. What do I mean by worshiper? Your unbridled enthusiasm for, for what you 
believing should be what? Should be af af no, affective. Should be so, it should be, what do you call that stuff? It should be, it should allow, should be catching. It should be, allow other people, other people should be able to, what's that word we use? Huh? No, 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 no. It, 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 contagious. Thank you, son. It should be contagious. It's amazing. You, if you're a father, your very nature, and I, 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 we, 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 have, we, we don't have children here, but your very nature as a man is to reveal yourself, and I'm going to use a word that doesn't mean what you think it means, so don't go the bad way. Should be ejaculatory in terms of worship. That is, that means it's got, but, but we used to word that it should be something that allows you to just explode in enthusiasm. Fathers, a father is a priest, and priests do not operate by passivity. Priests are worshipers. You too must worship. We were taught a lot of men are taught. Oh, don't show your emotions. Don't, don't, don't participate. Just stand there. So you go to churches and the men are like that. But I'm telling you, if you are not passionate enough, if you worship, if you're not engaged in passionate worship in the things around you, you don't show your power of worship. You don't show your passion. Your children will think it doesn't matter. Did you know this? That what you give your passion to is what your children pick up. It's amazing. They may not know what you're doing. This is, by the way, the secret for why most children become what their fathers were. If your stuff is singing, pretty soon your child is picking it up without even knowing what they want, what, that, that they're picking it up. If your stuff is studying, I know I talk about my kids, right? I spend hours, googlions of hours, no, reading, and there's not one of my child who doesn't want to read. It's funny stuff. I spend hours strumming on my guitar, playing, and all of a sudden, my little boy is like, that's what he went. And now he's doing stuff. I noticed that a lot of the stuff, now when they grow up, they're going to make their own decision. But when it comes to the fundamental stuff that makes for life, they tend to follow what they say their father's doing. That's both boys and girls, by the way. So we, we have to step away from this cultural structure that looks down on fathers, that puts fathers down, that looks at fathers as being stupid, at being the fools of the house, the dunces. Even there's some of you here who all you do is make fun of your fathers. And then once a year you go like, I'm so proud of my father. That's a lie. Unless we begin to honor fathers, we're going to continue to have children that have no directions. Doesn't mean that women can raise child, but it's much more difficult when the father is not present. So men, presence, faith intertwined with hope. What? Be a priest. So for believers... The man must be the one who intercedes for the family. We've done this stuff where we turn all the intercession to the women. You call for prayer meeting for intercession and it's mostly women. God answers. But God's always going to say, where's the man? Where is the father of the child? 
And if you are not present, then you're not really a father. You're a seed donator. If you don't have faith and hope for the future of the children that you brought into the world, and of course the children in the world, then you're not a father. If you're not a priest standing in the place of intercession for the future, for the present, for the members of your family, then you're not really a father. So I said, I'm part of the priesthood is to what? Is to operate in passionate worship of what you believe in. Okay? There's something else. A real father, a true father, is generous. If you're a stingy person, you probably are not fit to be a father because your children will never stop making demands on you. Doesn't mean you give them everything they want, but it means you have to have a generous heart to be a father. Because your children, if they have any sense, and sometimes they just decide they don't want to deal with you, that's a different thing, but your heart always got to be at the place of what? Generosity if they come close. If they decide. Which means that you and I have to figure out a way of being that is always open for forgiving our children. They say stuff to you that you're like, where's, the, where's Abraham's altar? Because I will not let God take you out of that altar. So where's Abraham's altar? Since, since, since you are being like that, Please, Lord, ask me to go sacrifice this child. Uh, come on, come on. But you have to have a heart that is willing to forgive if they, whenever they step back to you. Now, uh, children will say stuff to you that will make you, I'm gonna be, make you want to be onan. Uh, uh, the son of uh, Judah I want you to drop the seed on the ground instead of in your wife's body there are children that will do that there are children that will do stuff to you that you will say no one should have children but if you're a father you have to follow the footstep of God right here's what happens with the footstep of God is no matter how far the child goes, the father's heart still reaches out towards them. When they return, they are always accepted. The father's eyes is always looking across the hills, always looking across the valley, always looking across the ocean, always looking across the desert to hope that the child will come running like the prodigal, will come walking like the prodigal, and the father is always willing to rush to the child. Why does he kept? Fathers have a very soft heart. Like... I'm never going to talk to you again. And then the phone rings. Oh, yes, my son, how are you doing? Fathers do that. Doesn't mean everything is acceptable. Okay. Part of that thing that we're talking about is this openness, okay? this generosity. But it's not just generosity to your child. In order for children to learn generosity and hospitality, they must observe it in your life towards the people around you. Sometimes I wish I didn't do that with my children because my, my son, my older son, in spite of all his craziness, will, will give the things behind the, his, his, the clothes on his back to anyone. When he was working at the university, he had six children whose parents could not afford to take care of them who were at the university who were living in his house. He was feeding them, taking care of them. And then when he left, he didn't have any money for himself. I'm like, okay, son, you can, you, can do, you can do it that way, but you need to keep some money for yourself. And I wanted to get offended, and I said to myself, why am I getting offended? He learned it from us. Because we had 
We had three children. My wife is a hunter gatherer. <clears throat> so, so, so they, 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 they bring, they bring, <laughs> they, 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 it gathered the strays, you know, into the house. I am too, you know. But and it's funny. That's where our son learned that. He carries it more than the, our other kids. The other ones married people that balance them out. <laughs> oh, Jesus. They're probably listening to me now. I'm getting upset. But it's okay. It's so, so, so this thing about fatherhood, having a generous heart. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna mess you up sometimes. They're going to say, oh, you give to everybody except us, no matter what you do. But they're going to learn because children learn more than they tell you. They become what they observe until somebody else influences them. Fathers, be present. Fathers, have faith and hold on to hope. Fathers, be the priest to your children. Be a priest in the world. I can say a lot of stuff that people will say, oh, fathers do, they do the abusive father and all that stuff. But there are, we got to learn how to be fathers. No one grew up knowing how to be fathers. No one, even those who lived in good household, had to learn how to be fathers. This thing about generosity and hospitality. Think about it. I'm going to talk to fathers for a second. They're going to make fun of you. You're going to do certain things, but you will always, they'll always look at you like you're the bad person. But one day they're going to realize what your presence meant. Don't give up because you're being talked about. Because everything you do seems like no one cares. You don't receive thanks, really. You're working three jobs, but still it's not enough. Your mistakes are bigger than your kindness, than your right acts. It happens. But ultimately, what I've noticed in many places is the kids come around. They go, I don't like, but I thank God my father was around. Be present. Don't run. Don't turn on the children. Don't walk in Don't walk in existential doubt. Don't walk in doubt that affects the generation of your children. Believe that there's a possibility for those that you father at every level. It's not easy. But always believe in that. Be a father. But also be a priest. Remember, I'm a priesthood, which means you have the capacity to stand for them between this world and the other world. Between this world and God's world. Between this world and whatever. The demonic and the satanic world. You're able to stand in the middle. Persevere with your children. Persevere with the generation that's coming. Those of us who are fathers now. We persevere because this generation has a problem. Yeah, I know every generation says the next generation has a problem, but this generation has a problem. This generation doesn't even know who they are. They don't have an identity. I mean, we got all, some people now have about 24 identity. I thought that was multiple personality, but we'll leave it alone. We as fathers must begin to stand up. They will hate us for saying what we need to say. For telling them, look, this is who you are. Said, Don't tell me who I am. Yes! I'm telling you who you are because you came out of me. If you made yourself, then I don't have a right to tell you who you are, but you are here because of me. Now, like the women can say stuff, I brought you in this way, I can take you out. But the men can say, I have a right to tell you who you are. Fathers, one of the biggest things with fathers is don't walk in fear. No father is perfect. No father is perfect. Don't walk in fear. If you make a mistake, acknowledge it. But don't walk in fear. Have 
positive faith in the divine possibility of the people you father. Or the ones to whom you are a father. Young men, don't forget this. Be present. Have faith. The fact that my kids are still alive today is a miracle. The fact that you are still alive, your parents can still talk to you, is a miracle. If you have not spoken to your father because of all the stuff he did, you are now becoming a father. It's time for you to act like a father. Talking to young men now. See, the problem with, with, with not talking to your father because they did something wrong is that when you get to raise your own children without knowing it, you transfer some of that stuff to that generation. So a father must be generous, not just to the future, but generous to the ones who have done stuff to them behind so that they can build a new future. Mothers, we know you brought us into this world. But our focus today is on the fathers. Look at Abraham. Saw the strangers coming. And he turned around and said, please don't pass by. Come, let me give you something to eat. He hasn't had children yet. But it is in the context of being generous. The context of being hospitable. The context of standing in the tent, the veil between this world and other world. It is in that construct that Isaac came forth. The future is open to fathers who stand at the veil or between the curtains and are generous to the passers-by. It brings forth a future that impacts the world. But this is true for every human being. Generosity and hospitality. Forgive the past. Forgive the future. Forgive the past. Forgive the future. And the forgiveness for the future is when you believe in a positive, divinely orchestrated future and you don't give up because somebody is failing. Even in your last breath, believe in the future of the children you've said. Amen? Happy Father's Day. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We pray you've been blessed by it. For more from Dr. O, please go to www.activate.com.